everyone, welcome to Mercy Hill. My name is Christine and if you guys are new here, feel free to connect with us. On the upper right, there's a connection card that you can click on to send in any prayer requests or if you're new, we'd love to get to know you. And also say hi on the chat box on the right as well so you can say hi back. Otherwise, we have a few things coming up in the near future. The first is if you are have been attending Mercy Hill for a while now and want to take that next step to get plugged in, we have a covenant membership class that is opening up for any of you that want to become a covenant member. So you can sign up for that and get all the details in the notes tab or also in the newsletter. The next thing is that we also have the perspectives course which is coming up and that is all about getting your uh, mind and your heart inspired to see how God is continually um, having a heart and desire to bring all nations into his kingdom. So one of our own members, Becky, is actually the one who will be leading this course. It's going to be at Hillside Church next year, but they're taking signups right now. So we'd encourage any of you guys to check it out if you have a passion for this or just want to learn. And it's a really great course. I've only heard good things about it. So again, you can find that in the notes tab. Otherwise, today we do have a few things coming up in the afternoon, also the evening. We have the youth hike at 3 p.m. and also the all church prayer. Both of these are going to be held outside, but due to the air quality, we ask that you just stay tuned because we might have to postpone these things as we don't want to expose anyone to these unhealthy air conditions. So those might be postponed, but we will be letting you know um, later on today. Otherwise, we hope you enjoy this sermon and be sure to join us afterwards for the after party, which is a time of prayer and fellowship and discussion um, that will be in a Zoom room and we'll share the Zoom link after the sermon and kids will also have their kids worship coming up shortly after at 1130. So with that, I'll pass it on over to Nick and I hope you guys have a blessed Sunday. All right, well, good morning, uh, Mercy Hill, and thank you, Christine. Uh, my name is Nick. I'm the lead pastor here. Going to be getting us into God's Word momentarily, but first, also wanted to extend my uh, welcome to you if you are uh, visiting with us and checking out Mercy Hill uh, for the first time. Uh, glad to have you. Please do let us know if there's any way we can help you get plugged in. And one thing I should say um, regarding our Sunday services uh, the hope is, and maybe you could even join us in prayer, uh, the hope is that uh, next Sunday, so I guess that would make it, what, October uh, 11, uh, we may be able to uh, meet um, actually at Allen at Steinbeck Elementary outside. Uh, there's a space there. We've done an outside service before. We're getting up our gear and uh, trying to get a live stream in person slash at home uh, option for people Um uh, and and we'll, we'll see how it goes. So we'll be keeping you posted. Uh, if you don't hear anything, we'll be, you know, doing the same format as we have been. Uh, but otherwise, our, our hope and, and, and plan is to maybe even get that rolling uh, next Sunday. So uh, do look for announcement, whether that's on our uh, website, uh, our social media, our newsletter. Uh, we'll be blasting all that as soon as we can kind of lock that in. So... Um, Again, it is 2020, so who even knows? At that point, uh, an earthquake could have ripped through, and we'll, you know, we'll be like meeting in a, you know, uh, who knows, in a bunker in the ground. Uh, but you know, if it's not too smoky and it's not too crazy, uh, we may be able to try that. So we'll see, and I'd love to be able to see some of your guys' faces. Um, but with that, guys, I think we're ready to just dive right in. Uh, you can open up your Bibles. This is kind of part two of what we looked at last week. Uh, it's Luke chapter 20, verses 27 through 40 is where we're going to be. Let me read it. We'll pray, and uh, then we'll uh, get going for this morning. So Luke chapter 20, beginning in verse 27. There came to him some Sadducees, those who deny that there is a resurrection. And they asked him a question, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote for us that if a man's brother dies, having a wife but no children, the man must take the widow and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers. The first took a wife and died without children. And the second and the third took her, and likewise all seven left no children and died. Well, afterward, the woman also died. And then here's kind of their, their punchline. In the resurrection, therefore, whose wife will the woman be? For the seven had her as a wife. 
In verse 34, Jesus responds, Jesus said to them, the sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels and are sons of God being sons of the resurrection. But that the dead are raised, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush where he calls the Lord, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered, teacher, you have spoken well, for they no longer dared to ask him any question. Uh, let's pray. Well, God, we just ask your blessing upon our time together right now. Uh, we uh, pray along with the psalmist, and in, in Psalm 119 it is, uh, I think, that where he says, uh, show us, open my eyes to see wondrous things in your law, in your word. And right now, God, we're just praying you would open our eyes to see the beauty that's here, the things you're describing about the age to come and the reality of resurrection life. Um, God, help us kind of recalibrate uh, our hearts according to your revelation. Uh, we got a lot of stuff coming in at us all the time, and we're often shaped by it. We're often formed by it. Our emotions, our lifestyles, our desires shaped by these things. God, we want to be shaped and formed by your word, by truth, by the gospel by your glory. And, and so, Lord, I pray that you would use our time together to that end and to do uh, beyond what I could even think or imagine to ask in these moments. Do it for your glory and uh, do it for our good. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, well, it, it, it seems to me that uh, there uh, probably is no more important, no more uh, helpful a subject to consider uh, in trying, troubling times like the, the ones that we're in right now uh, than this subject of the age to come um, and the idea of the resurrection and heaven and the afterlife and eternity. Um, because I think, you know, this time has been destabilizing for a lot of us. I, I know that uh, we've probably all been struggling in one way or another, just kind of feeling like, my goodness, uh, is the, the city, the country, the world, my life, is it just kind of like we're on this sinking ship and we're going down, like things are starting to flatline and bottom out all around us. Um, and so I know a number of us probably, myself included, struggling with, you know, discouragement, uh, hopelessness, uh, d doubt, fear, panic, anxiety, depression, despair. You just keep going on. In fact, one of the things is the smoke was kind of coming in again this week. I just thought, you know what? This week when I preach, I just kind of want, it just feels right. I just want to sit down like this. I don't want, forget standing, forget the posture of authority. Let's just take up the posture of I'm tired. Are you tired too? Like, is that's kind of how this has felt is my goodness. Uh, another sky full of smoke, another heat wave, another fire, another shooting, another protest, another downturn in the market, another political firestorm, another, you know, it's just another threat to our health. You could just keep going and it just keeps happening. And so in times like these, uh, when we're just prone to kind of get sucked down in it all, one of the sweetest things, one of the greatest things we can do is actually set our mind on this idea of the age to come. And the reality that even in the midst of the crazy, God is here, he's at work, and he's taking uh, his children and this world uh, someplace good. That it's not a sinking ship, though it may feel like it. Uh, that he is, in fact, moving things forward. And we will see uh, it in the age to come, how all of these pieces were working together in his plan. And so sometimes... Coming, uh, you know, in the midst of this trial and then looking beyond that to the HTM can be very uh, restabilizing, reorienting for the soul. And what's great is this text is essentially bringing that out for us to consider 
um, together. So as I said, we began it kind of last week, made our way through a little bit. I'm going to have to do some recounting of that just to kind of catch us up to speed. Uh, and then we will uh, launch into some new material. Um, but I'll kind of interweave new reflections even as I um, uh, review a bit. But this text is going to help us get our mind on that idea of the age to come. And for us, while, um, while the idea of heaven, the idea of the age to come and, and God, the fulfillment of his plan, these sorts of things in eternity uh, may be comforting for us and for his children. Uh, for guys like the Sadducees in our text, these religious leaders there in Israel, uh, for guys like these Sadducees, uh, the news, the, the, the contemplation of the age to come is actually not comforting, uh, but threatening. Um, the Sadducees, you remember, they represent this uh, sort of liberal, religious, and, and even maybe political party, you could call them, uh, there in Israel, kind of in contrast to the more conservative uh, Pharisees. In fact, Sadducees, Pharisees, always kind of battling it out with one another, it would seem. Um, but these Sadducees, just to kind of refresh on who they were, they, they, it seems to, uh, most scholars seem to think they only accepted the first five books of the Old Testament as canonical or as scripture as God's word. So uh, the five books of, of Moses, the, the law, the Torah, that's what they accepted. And they kind of eschewed everything uh, else. And consequently, one of the things that they're known for is they didn't believe in the age to come. They didn't believe in the resurrection. They didn't believe in the afterlife. And they didn't even believe in some of the spiritual beings and things that you see elsewhere in the scriptures. Uh, they were very oriented towards this age. Um, and furthermore, these guys actually had uh, quite a bit of power uh, in the temple and in the Sanhedrin. Uh, these guys kind of had good lineage. They were of uh, priestly class. They had good education. Uh, they had good, uh, good you know, wealth and all that stuff was going on. They had a good life. They had a good life. Um, now, to kind of, you know, uh, maybe put a category on this for us um, to kind of help us bridge the gap, maybe even between our day and, 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 and Jesus's day here. I think you could, in one sense, at least call these Sadducees uh, secular. Um, the uh, word that we have uh, secular actually comes to us from the Latin secularis, which means of the age. And the idea then, uh, you know, what that's come to mean uh, in, in many cases is secular is this idea of, hey, I'm concerned with, I'm really only concerned with the things of this present age, the things of this world. I, I'm not concerned with the stuff of religion, transcendent reality, stuff that, that, that's concerning the age to come or the afterlife, just the here and the now, this age. And so these Sadducees, in that sense, at least, uh, we could say are secular while they are externally religious. They are fundamentally secular in that they are only really concerned with what's here and now. And even when they do religion, they do it uh, as a, as a way of making their life better here and now without any concern for the there and then the, the age to come. And what we need to understand is that, um, Jesus is always going to be a threat uh, to the secular person, um, to the person who is living for the present age, who has their heart fixed on this present time and wants their best life here and now. Let's eat, drink, and be merry because tomorrow we die. We just hit the dirt. It don't matter. It's all about today. Jesus is going to come in and he's always going to be a threat to secular people. Because this rabbi from Nazareth rolls in and he starts talking about heaven and hell. And he starts talking about the age to come. He starts talking about taking up your cross, suffering now, counting the cost, following him, the kingdom that's not of this world, but's coming, all of these things. He starts talking about these realities that a secular person isn't interested in. Can I put it in my belly? Uh, uh, you know, can I, can I feel it, uh, you know, with my, with my senses here and now the pleasure of it, the goodness of it. Uh, if I can't, if it's something ethereal, if it's something out there, not interested. And so 
Jesus is a threat and, and secular folks want to get rid of him. And that may even be where some of you are tuning into this, where, you know, Jesus and his claims, they're a threat to you and your plans for your life, the agenda that you have. It's disrupting that. So you're going to try to find ways to get rid of him, to get him out of the picture. And that's what these Sadducees essentially are doing here. I said last time they come to Jesus and they're asking this disingenuous question. We know it's disingenuous because Luke tells us they don't believe in the resurrection. And yet they're asking a question about the resurrection. So clearly they don't actually care. What they're trying to do is trip Jesus up in his messaging before the people. Uh, he believes in the resurrection. He's talking about it. They think they've found a hypothetical situation from the Old Testament law that makes the resurrection look ridiculous. And so they come asking this question, this hypothetical situation, uh, whose wife will she be? That sort of a thing. Uh, is she going to be married to seven guys in the age to come? Doesn't that make the resurrection look stupid? They're thinking they're going to uh, uh, catch Jesus in uh, this nonsense and, and be able to flip the crowds on him and get rid of him, get back to their good life here and now. But um, we mentioned last time in the other accounts of this story, Jesus comes right back at them with a stern rebuke. And I bring this up again because it helps us divide the text that we're going to look at. And, and it's really going to serve as my main headings. Uh, but Jesus, uh, Matthew twenty two twenty nine, 29, in one place, he, he turns and he says, listen, you guys are wrong. You don't know the power of God and you don't know the word of God. You don't know the power of God. You don't know the word of God. You think you've trapped me. <laughs> you think you've got me, but you are are wrong. And so the power of God, the word of God, that's really going to set us up uh, with regard to the power of God. We're going to talk about this idea of anemic imaginations. Okay. We can't even conceive of the power of God as it truly is. We're going to talk about anemic imaginations. And then secondly, with regard to the word of God, we'll talk about faulty interpretations, anemic imaginations, faulty interpretations. Let's go. The first one, Anemic imaginations uh, is what Jesus really deals with in verses 34 to 36. Uh, I'm not going to read it, but uh, that's kind of the section that we are in. Um, last time, uh, we kind of started off on this one, and I made note of really the fundamental error uh, that these Sadducees were making. And uh, Jesus is kind of putting his finger on here, the thing he's calling them out on. Um, and what I said is essentially this, they didn't know the power of God and, and what Jesus goes after here. He says, you are essentially wrongly calibrating your expectations of the age to come with your experiences in the age that now is. In other words, you just think that the age to come is going to be an elongation uh, an extension of the age that now is. You can't even begin to imagine or conceive of uh, a God who could, who could so transform and so resurrect uh, this world and, and, and you and, and your experience that he's actually going to set this world and set humanity on a whole new plane of existence. Your imagination is too anemic and you're just projecting onto the age to come the stuff you know of the age. To know. So you think you've got me when you say, hey, man, is she, is the, is she really going to be married to seven dudes in heaven? He's saying you have no idea. Heaven is, is going to be utterly transformed. There's going to be a radical uh, transformation of experience and existence. Now, to be clear. Uh, it needs to be understood that the world we now know, I think, will be organically related to the one that will then be I'm not saying it's something altogether different um, because we, we know that because, like, say, my physical body, in some sense, it seems is going to be related to my resurrection body. Hence, the disciples can recognize Jesus. 
Um, so there's some sort of continuity, but it, it's not one for one. It's more like the seed to the tree or, or the, the droplet to the ocean um, or the shadow to the substance. There is organic connection and correspondence between this age and the age to come, but there's also dramatic and miraculous transformation. And these guys couldn't wrap their imaginations around it. Jesus is saying, listen, let's talk about marriage for a moment. He's saying, listen, uh, there's not going to be marriage in the way that you've understood it in the age to come. Uh, Not that it's going to be worse, not that it's going to be less than, it's going to be more like seed to tree, like shadow to substance. You're not going to be married to one another. You're going to be married to the lamb. You're going to be brought into covenantal union with God. And what that means is, is you can essentially take any good experience you've ever had in your earthly marriage. You can take any good thing, whether you want to talk about, you know, ecstasy, pleasure. You want to talk about partnership, uh, 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 friendship. You want to talk about that sort of intimacy that you enjoy. All, take all the good moments, wrap that up, uh, multiply it by the power of a billion to the power of a billion. And then maybe you're coming close to what it be, will be like to be the bride of Christ in the age to come. That's what he's saying. You, your imaginations are so anemic. You, 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 you're, you're limiting the age to come by what you know in this present age. We've got to break through that because God's going to break through that. Now, Jesus goes on to tell us more about the age that is to come. Really, we only got to that first part. There's going to be no marriage. That's the only observation I really made last week. Uh, He's going to go on and he's going to tell us more here about the age to come. Uh, But what I actually wanted to do for a moment was spend a little bit more time with you thinking about this idea of anemic imagination, about about imagination in general. Because uh, what I really want to make clear to us is I think... Uh, heaven and, and uh, the, the age to come and the, the new heavens, new earth, however you want to phrase it, it is quite literally going to blow our minds. And we got to have that settled now. We can't be thinking we're going to be able to wrap our, our minds around it all. It's it, we're literally going to be blown. When we get there, it's just going to be uh, mind shattering. Um, and I want us to almost expect that rather than expecting everything is going to fit into our little categories now. And if not, I'm going to have a, you know, I'm going to take up a beef with God or whatever it is. I want to show you how it's actually reasonable to move towards God in this way. Um, but let's think about this idea of imagination for a moment. Um, I, if you're like me, I, I, I used to think, and in reflecting on this, I realized this is the only time it really kind of came out and I realized this. Uh, I used to think that reason, okay, my reason is kind of what's grounded and tethered to the facts and reality as it is. But my imagination, my imagination was cut loose and, and it was free to roam and to soar, you know, in the cloud. There was no limits on my imagination. But um, I came to realize this isn't exactly right. That my imagination, actually, and yours as well, is in fact, uh, in many ways, uh, kind of limited and bound by my experiences, in, in some cases, just as much as my reason is. That I can't get beyond the categories that God has already provided to get into something else. Um, I'll give you a it's kind of a silly example, but when we come to like say, hey, I am going to imagine a new and magical creature. Uh, The best we can do is like come up with like a unicorn, right? Which if you think about it, all it is is a mashup of stuff we know. Okay, I know a horse and I've seen horns on rhinos and other things. Let's bring it together and we have a new magical creature. We're all sitting back going... It just doesn't seem all that great. Okay, great. Well, let's put the wings of a bird on it. And then we have like an alicorn, right? So you can tell I have little daughters who watch My Little Pony. Uh, But this is like the best we can do is take the stuff that we know, the categories we know, and mash them together. That's the best even our imaginations can do. We may come up with a new recipe, 
but we're still using the same old ingredients. Our imaginations, just like our recent, are kind of confined and bound um, by our present experience, tethered, limited, restrained. And all over creation, I think, God has tried to prepare us for the reality that he is going to be beyond what we can uh, reason through or even imagine. That he is, it's actually going to be reasonable to expect uh, this God to blow our minds. He's, he's put this sort of reality interwoven all throughout scripture. Last week, I talked about the, the, the seed that turns into the coastal redwood and how Paul says, listen, resurrection life is going to be like that. What you now, now, know now is the seed, but then it's going to blow up like that in the age to come. And he gives us these analogies to, to wrap our little minds around a little bit and say, oh, wow, that, that is significant. I can kind of get that using that picture. Well, there's another picture that I wanted to give you here this morning. Um, I want to talk about instead the stars and the universe now. Uh, because Megan and I, we just finished up a show uh, where these guys were, you know, pretty typical these days. They were trying to get to Mars. It was this mission. They're going to be the first ones to Mars. And, you know, everyone is, is, is so in awe of these guys and what they're doing. And there's all these issues. And it's so crazy. And, of course, you know, man, we went to the moon and everybody went nuts. Well, how crazy would it be to get to Mars? And these guys finally get there. And, and the world watching everyone ever just goes crazy like like what an amazing accomplishment. And at the end of the show, I just kind of sat back and I said, now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. We, we get so worked up. Well, first of all, we haven't even made it to Mars. We're not even close. This is just a show. But we'd get so worked up and so proud of our accomplishment if we could make it to Mars. And I thought Mars is just one planet away in one solar system, in one galaxy. And I got on Google, because I'm not a, a star guy, I don't know all this, I'm amazed by them, but I don't know that much about it. And I just said, okay, wait, 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 wait. We're, let, let's, let's spread this out a little bit. Let me, let me think about the size here and how small that big accomplishment really is. Because we're talking now about a solar system that has, well, I, I guess it's up for debate, depending on what you want to do with poor little Pluto out there, uh, eight or nine planets in it, right? Back in my day, Pluto was a full-blown planet. I guess he got downgraded. I was, I was sad to hear that. Uh, but yeah, eight or nine planets in our solar system, and we can't even make it to the next one, okay? But now we're just talking about one solar system in our Milky Way galaxy. I looked and they estimate somewhere around 100 billion other solar systems within our one Milky Way galaxy. And I say, okay, but that's still just within one galaxy. So then you look and you see the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, they've, they've seen about what they think is probably 100 billion galaxies. But that's just limited by their current instruments and technology. And they assume they'll just continue to see more and more and more. And it's enough to make you, it's enough to blow your mind. And this is why God does this. I think you guys, we have living analogies just woven through creation all around us to help us expect almost, listen, God is not going to fit in our boxes. The heavens are declaring the glory of God and his greatness. And we hardly pay attention and we still act as if he's got to bend to our reason. He better fit within the capacity of our imaginations or we're just going to kind of move on. But this God, man, he, he doesn't need to travel to Mars. He's already there. He doesn't need to count the stars. He knows them by name. He named them, Isaiah says. It's just a way of saying, there he is. He's outside of it all. He's going to blow our categories, our constraints, our boxes out of the water. He's going to blow our minds. Long and short here, upshot of all this, with regard to this text and what Jesus is saying about uh, the, the age to come and things, we, we got to be careful that we don't impose the limits of our anemic imaginations upon our conceptions uh, of heaven um, and what God is able to do in the age to come. We got to know he's going to break those limits. 
He's going to go even beyond not just what we can reason through and rationally consider, but what we can even imagine. If you're starting to get, get to that space, that's where I want you to be just, wow, just in awe. Now, that being said, he still wants us to try to imagine. He still is going to try to use categories to help us get what that age to come is like. And that's really what we're going to do uh, here now with this idea of um, our, our anemic imaginations and now thinking about the age to come and these verses, especially verse uh, 36 here. Uh, last time, first observation I made was there's going to be no, no marriage. At least not as we've understood it. Uh, now I've got observations two through four. I want to bring out uh, three more for us here. So observation number two, in the age to come, we cannot die anymore, Jesus says. We cannot die anymore. You see it there in verse 36. But those who are considered worthy to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead, neither marry nor are given in marriage, for they cannot die anymore. Now, there's a lot of places I could go with this, but one of the first things that came to my mind was uh, Hebrews 2.15, where the author of Hebrews says this. Uh, he's talking about how Jesus came to, quote, deliver all those who through fear of death were subject to lifelong slavery. Uh, fear of death because of it, subject to lifelong slavery, Jesus has come to set us free. And this text always confused me. This idea that uh, my whole life is, uh, I've been afraid of death and I'm enslaved because of it. I, I, I thought about it, I'm like, I just don't know. I, I think there are some out there who are probably, would probably say, yeah, I am afraid of death. I, it, it terrifies me. It paralyzes me. I don't know why, but I'm thinking about it. I'm scared. Uh, but then a lot of us, I think, actually don't think enough about death. We kind of think we're going to keep going on and, and life as we know, it's just going to keep rolling when we're consumed with all other manner of things, not with, you know, I'm going to die and, and we're enslaved by this fear. And so I thought, wait, wait. Why is the author of Hebrews saying that? What is God getting at with this? I am I doing what I'm doing because I'm afraid of death and that fear is enslaving me? Is that what's going on in my life? And um, as I reflected, when I kind of shifted the category from death to loss, it all started to make sense because death it is ultimately kind of that, that, that final expression, that ultimate expression of loss. Just everything, even your last breath, it's no longer yours. You've lost it. It's gone. And when I thought about loss and the category loss, then I could see more clearly how, well, yes, I think a lot of what we do it is done because we're afraid of losing one thing or another. We're kind of enslaved by, by this idea that we got to try to keep, we don't want to lose, we got to keep it together. And death is just that final blow <laughs> of loss, just losing everything. So think about this with me. We're afraid of losing our job, right? So we sacrifice everything, our, 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 our kids, our, our dignity, our, our physical health even, to, to keep that job or to keep that place. Um, we're afraid of losing our looks, perhaps. So we obsess over diets and exercise and calorie intake and, 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 and you know, skin cream or whatever it may be. Hair plugs, whatever you want to say. We're afraid of losing the approval of our peers, just afraid of losing that. And so we carefully kind of edit and censor ourselves and present the best version of ourselves to those in our lives in accordance with what we think they'll like so that they will approve. And we hide those things that we are ashamed of and we don't want to let anybody see. We're afraid. We're enslaved by this fear of losing the love of other people. Or we're afraid of losing our possessions, perhaps, so we keep our homes and our lives locked up tight. Got the lock and key, got the alarm system, we got everything in place so that we don't lose what we have. 
We do all that we do in an effort to keep what we have. We're enslaved by the fear of losing it. And death really comes in, as I've been saying, as this kind of final nail on the coffin, as it were, no pun intended, where it's the ultimate expression of loss. It's the climax of deprivation. It's the victory of vanity. It just laughs in our face. You're going to lose it all, whatever you have left. Give it to me. It's mine. Death lays claim on it. Life, as it were, is this um, slow motion slip down the slope of loss, ending in the dark, dank hole of your own grave. Is that a nice uplifting message for you? I, I think we feel that. And we fight it and we resist it. But that's, I think, what the author of Hebrews is talking about. We feel this, and it enslaves us. We're always trying to figure out how to not lose, how to not go the way of dust. This is why Iris Murdoch says that death is the most terrible of facts. It's so final. Or this is why T.S. Eliot wrote, I will show you fear in a handful of dust. From dust you came to dust you will return. I'll show you fear in a handful of dust because that's where you're going, both king and peasant in the ground. Doesn't matter how much money. Doesn't, you can't stop it. Ultimate loss. Death always gets the last word until Jesus, right? So the English poet George Herbert writes, death used to be an executioner, but the gospel has made him a gardener. I've read that to you before. I love it. Used to be an executioner, used to drive that final nail into the coffin. It's over, but the gospel, Jesus' sacrifice for our sins, his resurrection for our justification and new life has turned death from executioner to gardener. No longer is he driving a nail into the coffin. It's as if he's dropping a seed into the soil and in the warmth of tomorrow's sun, that seed's going to explode with new life. That's what Jesus does. That's what he frees us from. This is what Paul is exalt, exulting in when he says in 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 57, when the perishable puts on the imperishable and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O oh, death, where is your victory? O oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin. The power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. It used to have the last word, but now he does. <laughs> now he does. And his word over you and me is life. They cannot, Jesus says, die anymore. If you're in Christ, you don't have to be afraid of loss. You don't have to be enslaved to the fear of death. You've been set free. Observation number three about the age to come. In the age to come, we will be equal to angels. We will be equal to, Jesus says, angels. Now this is, if you carry on in verse 36, what you see, uh, for they cannot die anymore because they are equal to angels. Now in the Greek, it can be rendered here like the angels. And that's probably better. In fact, in Matthew and Mark's account, it's more clear in the Greek that, that the meaning is like the angels. And I think that's probably what's in, intended. The idea is not so much, hey, we're going to be equal to the angels in terms of status, but more like we're going to be like the angels uh, along the lines of what's been discussed in uh, by Jesus already in this text, namely like the angels and that we uh, will not be uh, married to one another and like the angels in the sense that we will not die. But there's more that I thought about on this and I don't have much time, but I did at least just want to rifle off a few things. Um, 
It, it, it amazed me as I kind of looked at, what is it like the angels? What is that going to be? What is, or even equal to angels? I was like, oh, that sounds crazy. And then as I did more research, and you can check me on this, it, it's because I, I want you to check me because it honestly sounds a little crazy. It sounds a little bold. But as I was looking into what the scriptures have to say about us and angels and the age, age to come, it would seem to me that men and women in Christ, in the resurrection, in the age to come, far from being beneath the angels or even equal to them, we shall in some sense at least be superior. If that's what just made me kind of tremble a bit like am i am i uh in the right place here it, but in many ways it would seem men and women are situated above the angels now hear me on this if not in being class or rank then at least at least in god's heart and i think that's without dispute in god's heart there's this special privilege we are given, the special affection that God has for you and I that he doesn't have for the angels. And that's going to come into full flower in the age to come and in the resurrection. Let me just show you a little bit of why I'm thinking this. And again, I can't elaborate. It's just going to be quick. But for one thing, the angels were not created in the image of God. Only human beings were men and women. Or another thing, the author of Hebrews writes this, Hebrews 2, 16 through 17. Surely it is not the angels that Jesus helps. It just goes out of the way to say this. It's not the angels that Jesus helps, but he helps the offspring of Abraham. Therefore, he had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of the people. Jesus doesn't take on the form of an angel and go and die for the sins of fallen angels. No, but he does that for the children of Abraham. He does that for the sons of Adam. He does that for human beings. It's incredible. So Peter writes how the angels, therefore, are longing to look into the things of the gospel. First Peter 1 Peter 1.12. They are longing to look, almost peering over the edge of heaven, as it were, to see man, what God is doing with us, what he's revealing to us in Jesus. This special privilege we have. They're going, let us in on some of that. We want to hear about it. We want to see it. It's amazing. Furthermore, angels, uh, the author of Hebrews tells us again, are all ministering spirits sent out to serve for the sake of those who, who are to inherit salvation. That's you and I. So not only does God not send Jesus to particularly help the angels, but he actually sends the angels to help us. And serve us. And keep us on the straight and narrow and things. And then in 1 Corinthians 6, 3, Paul says something astounding that in the age to come, we shall in one way or another at least be judging angels. Says, Do you not know that you're going to judge angels? Ephesians 2, 6, we're told that we're raised up with Christ and seated with him in the heavenly places. Angels don't get that seat. You and I do right there with Christ. Redeemed sinners brought close. It's crazy. Or finally, Paul in Romans 8, 29 tells us this, those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. So that image we were created in, uh, uh, in, in Adam that was marred is, is, is ultimately going to be uh, redeemed and, and, and consummated again in Christ. And we're going to be conformed to the image of Christ and made God's children. This is not, uh, as far as I can see, the workflow, the plan God has for the angels. It's what he has for you and I. So in the age to come, we'll be like the angels. But in a sense, our position will be higher and our experience will be richer. And I think this is where Jesus goes uh, next with this idea of in the age to come, we will be sons of God. This is observation number four. In the age to come, we will be sons of God. So verse 36 continues on. They are sons of God, being sons of the resurrection. Now, you got to understand something, especially ladies here. 
Uh, if I had to be okay being the bride of Christ in uh, the earlier part of this verse, then you got to be okay being the son of God in the latter part of this verse because we, we get what's happening here. It's not a gender issue. The bride of Christ is pointing us towards this covenantal union and intimacy and enjoyment and ecstasy in the relationship with God. This idea of son of God is pointing us towards the, the sort of privileged place that a son would enjoy in those days in the family and the, the inheritance that would be rightly his. And so whether you're, you know, male, female, if you're in Christ, in, in this sense, you are a son, although I'll say child, right? You are a son of God. The privilege, the, the inheritance, it's yours, it's ours. I thought of 1 John 3, 1 through 2 on this point, especially because he brings in the idea of our being children uh, in view of the resurrection as well. And he says this, See what kind of love the Father has given us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us that it, is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him, because we shall see him as he is. He's talking about the age to come. He's talking about when Jesus is going to usher in the new heavens and new earth. And he's saying we're going to be like him. We're going to take on his image, and we're going to be brothers in the household. We're going to be the children of God. It's incredible. You are a beloved child, son, daughter, whatever you want to say, of God, if you're in Christ. And I want us to sit on that for a moment, because it really touches on the idea of our identity, which I think we're always prone to drift from the identity that Jesus has given us, um, from this fundamental sense that we are a beloved child of God in him. Uh, we're always prone to attach our identity and our sense of self to other things, right? Um, uh, whether we're talking about the opinions of people, we're talking about our jobs, our vocations, talking about our possessions. Um, we're prone to go there and attach our life and our identity to it. And I think this pandemic and, and all the turmoil surrounding it that's going on in our uh, city, our country, our world, has really rattled probably some of these things that we'd be prone to attach ourselves to. And man, Jesus is just calling us back to the stable identity that we have in him. I mean, so some of us probably, man, you're just feeling the ground uh, shaking right now. Like, I I've got to rethink work. I I'm going to lose my job. I, I may lose my house. I I I I'm, I'm losing relationships. There's tension, and, and I can't have the community. All these things that I used to kind of wrap my identity up and find my self-worth in, uh, find my justification in, they're going. The ground is rattling. It's threatening to leave, to fall underneath my feet. And what then? Well, Jesus is saying, I'll tell you what then. Here's the stable identity that my father gives you by the spirit in me in view of what I did at the cross. Man, the spirit of adoption is yours and you are a beloved child of God. And that's stable. Now John says it's now. We are children now. We know that now. And then we get from Jesus and from other places like Romans 8, that it's, it's, it's now and yet it's not even close to being fully realized. That in the age to come and in the resurrection, it's going to be kind of like catapulting us into the lap of our father, into the family room of our God. We're going to experience the fullness but it's stable. It's as stable as God's plan. And the new heavens and new earth, it's not going to go up and down with the stock market or with, you know, your, your friend's opinions or whatever. You're a beloved child of God because you're in Christ. And, and Christ is stable. Well, so are you. I hope that settles deep. I hope it stabilizes your soul and your heart. Now, those are a few of the things under anemic imaginations and kind of considering what the age to come is going to be like. Now, we're going to close things out by looking at this idea of faulty interpretations, verses 37 and 38. Um, Jesus says, you know, you guys don't know the power of God, right? Uh, and then he, he also turns and says, 
you don't know the word of God. You know, neither God's power nor God's word. Well, now it's God's word that he's going to take issue with uh, in these verses. And that's what I want you to see. So I'm just going to read verses 37 and 38. And here we again come to the idea of faulty interpretations. But that the dead are raised, Jesus says, even Moses showed in the passage about the bush where he calls the Lord, the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now he is not God of the dead, but of the living for all live to him. Now, here's the thing you have to love about Jesus. He is always willing to meet you where you're at. If you're a woman at the well and you're thirsty, let's talk about water. If you're a crowd, you know, out in the countryside and you're hungry, let's talk about the bread of life. Okay. And if you're here, a Sadducee and, and all you believe in or all you're trusting in is, is the five books of Moses, the law. Well, let's talk about Moses. I see what you value. I see the world that you're living within. I'll meet you there. It's the incarnational uh, incarnation principle just brought into evangelism. He meets people where they are and then walks them towards the truth, walks them towards the biblical world view. So you value Moses. I saw that up in verse 28 in your question. Moses tells us to do this. Well, let's talk about what Moses says. Then I'll meet you there. Uh, he's accommodating without compromising. He draws near in compassion, but calls out with conviction. We're usually good at one or the other. Jesus, of course, is perfect at both. This is the sort of thing that Paul is talking about in 1 Corinthians 9. And some of us know this, where he says, listen, I become all things to all people that I may save some. He's not talking about people pleasing. He's talking about meeting people where they are. He's talking about this incarnation principle of coming into their world, having compassion, and then having the conviction to call them towards the truth and the courage to call them, uh, to step with them towards the world as it truly is. And Paul just learned that from Jesus as we see Jesus doing it here. So these guys don't believe in the resurrection, but they value Moses. So he says, all right, let's talk about the resurrection as it's found in the book of Moses. So he goes to Exodus 3, 6. That's the text he's alluding to where God is uh, talking to Moses from the burning bush there. And he says, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Jesus uh, essentially says, there it is. What more do you need? That's my case for the resurrection in the age to come. And, and you and me, they look at the scratch and they go, uh, come again? I, I, I'm not sure I see the case for the resurrection in Exodus 3, 6. But his whole case, we come to understand, rests on the tense of that verb. You see, let me run it the opposite way. Yahweh doesn't say here to Moses, I was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. For that would imply I was their God, but now they're dead. They ain't their God anymore. I'm not the God of the dead. They're in the dirt. It's over. I'll be your God, present tense, but I can't be their God. That's past tense. I was the guy, but he doesn't say that. Instead, Yahweh says to Moses, I am. Indeed, I still am the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, because by implication, they're all still alive. <laughs> and I'm not done with them yet. That's just what had these Sadducees and these scribes and things floored. So, oh my gosh, it's right there. The resurrection, the reality of eternal life is right there. You see, God's covenant relationship with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob didn't stop when they died. If anything, it was only just beginning. I wonder if you've actually really paused and considered the stories of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob as they're told to us in the book of Genesis. It's actually uh, pretty depressing in some ways, the way that it ends. It's, it's a tragedy in the Shakespearean sense, it would seem. It, it doesn't end 
well. And you kind of go, wait, really? So if you know much about the book of Genesis, you know that God shows up and he says, listen, I'm going to do something awesome and I'm going to give the land to your offspring and all this. But then Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob all die sojourners, foreigners, strangers in the land of promise. That's going to be given to people when that's taken, you know, by Joshua years and years later. These guys put their bones in a cave <laughs> in, in, in a land that's not theirs. And it's just hidden away in there, uh, hoping hey, maybe something will happen. But it's like, it's a tragedy. It seems like God kind of left them hanging. It's a, it's a letdown unless... God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. Unless there's another chapter, unless the story's not done. You see, the resurrection uh, and is the only thing that really resolves the tension that we feel at the end of some of these stories. The resurrection is what transforms what seems at first to be a tragedy into a surprising and everlasting comedy. Like if, if they just left their bones in a cave in a land that wasn't theirs, well, gosh, pity them. But if as the author of Hebrews says, man, they were walking by faith and they knew God was not done and, and whatever this land symbolized, it, we would see it uh, in the age to come. Man, then they are our examples and they're triumphant in their faith. So the author of Hebrews says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he went out not knowing where he was going. By faith, he went to live in the land of promise as in a foreign land, living in tents with Isaac and Jacob, heirs with him of the same promise. For he was looking forward to the city that has foundations, whose designer and builder is God. In other words, brothers and sisters, they were looking forward to the age to come in the resurrection. They didn't know how it was going to happen. They just knew God is not the uh, God of the dead, but a God of the living. And he's going to make this story end well, he's going to be true to his word. And so Jesus is leveraging all of this to say, look, the resurrection is right there. And I think for us, the idea is simply this. God's not going to fail you. He's not going to forget you, neglect you, abandon you. And you may be feeling that right now in the midst of this chaos just ready to give up. Listen, God is not giving up on you. God is right here and he will be faithful to you even through death. Jesus says, listen, they can chop off our heads as they persecute us for the faith or whatever. But I tell you, not one hair of your head is going to perish. How could he say that? Because of the resurrection. Because God's not a God of the dead, but God of the living. And he's going to be your God. He's put your, his name on you and he will be faithful. He's going to bring you into the banquet room of heaven and seat you at the table next to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I love this, Matthew 8, 11. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. They will be there. And so will you. Now, there is one massive question that I've left unanswered to this point, And I just wanted to close with this. Um, it comes uh, there in, in verse 35, as I was reading it, Jesus makes it plain that not everyone, maybe not even these Sadducees, right? It would seem are going to uh, make it through death into this age to come, at least in a good way and resurrection life and glory. Not everyone is resurrected to eternal life. Some, we're told, are resurrected to, to judgment and eternal death. And there's this thing, it seems like the whole issue hinges on this idea in Jesus' words of being considered worthy. So he says, verse 35, those who are considered worthy 
to attain to that age and to the resurrection from the dead will experience all these things we've just elaborated on beyond your imagination, goodness, greatness. You say, well, how do I get considered worthy? I mean, that seems to be the big issue here. How do I get that? How do you get that? How do we get considered worthy of the age to come? I want it. How do I get it? Well, the Pharisees taught the way you get worthy to attain the age to come is by cleaning up your act, good works, you know, trying harder, all of those sorts of things. And some of us may feel that like, Gosh, I gotta, okay, I want this. I gotta show God that I am worth loving, that I am clean enough, that I can be a son, that I, you know, whatever. I've gotta clean it up. But the Apostle Paul, that's amazing. His story is amazing. He was a Pharisee at one point, you remember. He was living and operating under that. And he just said, at one point, finally, when God, when Jesus revealed himself to him, he just said, you know what? That is a waste of my time. I may be able to improve a little bit here or there, but my heart is still shot through with sinful motivations. No matter how much I clean the shirt <laughs> and the externals, the inside is still off. I can't get worthy to attain eternal life. How do I get there? And Paul's answer is where you go, you flee to the only one who ever was worthy, who is worthy to attain it. Jesus. I'll just close by reading these words and maybe they'll be your own this morning. Philippians 3, 4 through 11, Paul says this, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I was circumcised. I had all the good works. In other words, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. As to the law, I was a Pharisee. As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, I stood for righteousness. As to righteousness under the law, I was blameless. But, verse 7, whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. Indeed, I count everything as lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I've suffered the loss of all things and count them, even my righteousness, as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on faith, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection. In other words, I may consider worthy for that and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible, I may attain the resurrection from the dead. How do you get worthy? You run to the only one who ever was worthy and you cling to him by faith with all you have. Let's pray. Jesus, you are our hope. Forgive us when we're still kind of clinging to the shreds of our own righteousness and our own integrity. We just want to count all that as loss and run to you. You paid for all my sin. All my iniquity carried on your back, broken under the wrath of God for me. And you rose up again from the dead three days later. Not merely to boast in your own power, of your own power and greatness, but to declare victory for sinners like me that the way to resurrection life has been opened in you. And the age to come freely given to sinners who hold out a beggar's hand. So here we are. Help us, we pray. Amen. Well, guys, thank you for uh, tuning in. Um, 
And now is the time where I just invite you to join us in the after party, which you'll see the link uh, for uh, the Zoom uh, meeting there uh, in the chat box. Hope to see you. If for some reason you're busy, you can't make it, then have a wonderful rest of your Sunday. God bless you and keep an ear out for an announcement uh, regarding next Sunday's service. We'll see if we can get that rolling. Love you guys and uh, hope you have a wonderful rest of your week.